Hello and welcome to today's webinar presented by O3 Solutions. What's new in work packaging? Today's topic is top 14 construction and engineering metrics you should be tracking and why. So before we begin, let's take a quick safety moment. This one's on the importance of flexibility and movement, otherwise known as taking a BLT break. No matter what your fitness level, you should move your spine in every direction and follow BLT. And that means bend forward, bend backward, lean left, lean right, twist left, twist right. And then you need to stop once you feel a sensation. Take a deep breath to relax, and use the floor or wall for support if you need it. Always remember to move from your spine, not your head or neck. And having good flexibility helps reduce stiffness, injuries, and it's good for your joints. So take time to flex and stretch. And now let's take a look at today's agenda. First, we'll introduce our speakers and provide a brief overview of O3. Then we'll jump into the presentation with establishing KPIs, goals, and reporting for construction and engineering. Once we've reviewed the key takeaways, we'll have a brief Q&A with our speakers. And as a reminder, you can submit questions throughout the presentation via the chat feature on your GoToWebinar control panel. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Nick Maloof. Nick is O3's training coordinator who leads our live training implementations. He creates the training materials for our new and existing clients while maintaining O3 software documentation. He's also your go-to support for O3. And next, we have our Director of AWP and Construction Excellence, Andrew Foy. Andrew has served 16 years in the industrial construction space with six years in AWP dedicated roles. He's the co-chair of CII Performance and Benchmarking Subcommittee on AWP, and he's a member of CII AWP CBA leadership. Thanks for joining us, guys. Now let's take a moment to share who O3 is. <clears throat> O3 is a modern web-based platform that leverages AWP and agile best practices to disrupt the status quo for companies in industrial construction. Our software is built to improve productivity, safety, quality, and predictability. Now I'll turn it over to Nick to begin the presentation. Thanks again for joining us, Nick. Thank you, Tori. And we will be starting off our discussion today by going over what AP, AWP KPIs are. And when approaching the topic of KPIs, it's important to have the, certain, a certain mindset uh, when you're looking at them. And that is going to be that you don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect. Basically what that means is you, you can't really know what the health of your project is or whether or not it's on track unless you have benchmarks to measure your project against. And that's what KPIs are. They're a tool for measuring AWP adoption and success on your project. And it's important that these expectations are clearly documented and agreed on early on. And then once you do agree on these, they should be measured throughout the life of your project in order to confirm that AWP is being implemented properly, but also to quantify the benefits of your AWP program. And today we will be taking a look at some examples of AWP KPIs. And so in establishing AWP KPIs, we have a few goals that we want to accomplish. That is going to be to establish which metrics are to be assessed on the project, to determine the data sources that are going to contribute to those KPIs then also to understand the target for what each of our metrics will be. A nice way to wrap all of this up is you want to measure what's important to your project success. Uh, you need to make sure that the goals that you set match what you actually want to measure for your project. And so for our first set of KPIs, we are going to be going over construction today. Here's a brief overview of, we, of what we will be discussing. And for our first KPI, we have the IWP backlog. Now this is going to show you the amount of constraint-free work that's in hand and that your uh, field personnel are going to be supporting. And the reason why we want to track this KPI is it's important to know the amount of constraint-free work because ultimately this is going to inform how much manpower we have budgeted. And the way we'll be calculating this is we'll be looking at the total hours of constraint-free IWPs that are ready to be executed on. 
And ideally, you want to have about a month's worth of work uh, on hand for the manpower that'll be on site. So with backlog, Nick, I think it's important to understand that there's a couple of aspects of this. Uh, one, if you're the owner of the, this is going to allow you to get a very good status check on the contractor's packaging efforts. Quite honestly, if the contractor is just always packaging hand to mouth and always only a couple of days ahead, they're not following AWP best practices and they're not going to get the benefits of proper planning. But also it's very useful for the contractor. I've been on a number of jobs where the owner will say, bring out more people, bring out more people. Um, and it's very, very difficult to argue against that sometimes. So what this will do for you as the contractor is you can be able to say to the owner, you're asking me to bring out an extra 20 pipe fitters. Well, I only have work in hand for the pipe fitters that I have for another 10 days. So there's no point me bringing out additional people only then to rush through the available work that we've got and lay them off. So you can show my backlog is based on what I have available. I don't have enough available to support anything more than I already have. So it's a good barometer for both sides of the conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Andrew. And at number two, we have average hours per IWP. And this is going to be the standard size of each package that's been issued for execution. And this is important to track because it's it's very important to make sure that we're sticking to the agreed upon parameters, the standard size that you've agreed to for your work packages. And this will be calculated as the total number of IWPs divided by, or the total hours of IWPs, approved IWPs, or divided by the number of approved IWPs. And the target here is going to be between 500 and 1,000 hours. That's going to be equivalent to one to two weeks of work. But it's also worth noting that this will uh, vary based on the size and scope of your project. Yeah, and this is one that's often a very common argument. Um, you know, contractors and, and owners and even AWP professionals will push back on this and discuss what this should be. But this is currently the best practice range. It should be noted, as you said, it's an indicator only. You will get some packages that are 1,200 hours. You will get some packages that are three or 400 hours because of logical scope breaks. Never, never, ever, ever chop off a work package at exactly 1,000 hours because the book says that's as big as it can be. If it goes to 1,020 hours and that's the end of a logical scope break, do it. But the point here is, we want to try and avoid having a whole bunch of really, really small packages because what you're doing there is putting a lot of pressure on your workplace planners to build more packages than they should need to. Um, so that puts a lot of strain on them and a lot of workload on them. But on the other side, on the flip side of what we see more commonly is the somewhat more lazy approach to it where the packages are 2,000 hours, 3,000 hours. And what you lose there is the granularity. Um, a lot of the value of these packages being discrete in size is that granularity that you can see progress, you can see status updates. And if the packages are appropriately sized, you can see that information sooner and with more level of detail. If you create IWPs that are 10,000 hours and you've got rules of credit that are 20%, 30%, 40%, you're not going to see that level of granularity. So it's finding that sweet spot in between. Absolutely. And for our third KPI, we have time in the field. And this is going to be the average amount of time that each package spends being executed. And we want to track this because we want to make sure that each IWP is finished up promptly so that way we can move on to execution on another installation work package. And this is going to be calculated as the average number of days that each IWP spends in the in progress status. Our target here is going to be five to 10 working days. Again, that's going to be equivalent to about one to two weeks of work. And you'll see any of our eagle-eyed viewers will see from the bar chart that's on the screen. This is our, this is dummy data that we have in one of our tools here, but you know, we're showing an average of 49 days in the field for IWPs. And believe it or not, this is common, where a package is supposed to be five to 10 days of work, and most of the work will get done. 95% of it will get done. But for some reason, the last step can't be done or doesn't get done. The package gets done, but not as we refer to as done done. Um, 
And all that then happens is the planner gives another package to the foreman, the crew goes off and starts doing something else. And you've got a package that sits incomplete for weeks or sometimes months. Then you just have to come back later and do a whole bunch of cleanup, punch list items, et cetera. So having this, having clear visibility on this and seeing which of those packages are lingering, if you've got packages that can't be finished, de-scope the bit that can't be finished, close the package, put that other element back into another package and keep your timing tight. And for our fourth KPI, we have IWP readiness or constraint free. And this shows the average amount of time that it takes each package to be ready for, uh, to be ready to be issued for execution. The reason why we want to track this is this is a good indicator of play. So if IWPs are only being constraint free shortly before or even after the plan start date for your installation work package, well, that shows that there's gaps in your planning process and that improvement is needed. We will be calculating this as the average between the number of days that the IWP is constraint free and its planned start date. Our target here is to have all constraints closed on your IWPs between 21 and 30 days uh, prior to their planned start date. So that target typically comes from a lot of construction companies uh, in certainly in North America will use what they refer to as a three week look ahead. And one of the key aspects you want to have is you want to make sure that when you're getting work onto your look ahead, you know it can be done. Don't put work onto your look ahead if you've still got outstanding constraints, if you don't yet have the material on site, if you don't yet have the drawings, you're trusting to luck that they will come in in time. So you want to make sure you aren't waiting until the last minute to clear your constraints. You want to give the field supervision staff the ability to plan their work and their resources efficiently because every time you put a package onto your three-week look ahead that's not constraint free you run the risk that the constraint won't be cleared by the time you say you're going to do it you keep pushing it out and pushing it out then the foreman superintendent general foreman all have to keep rearranging their plans and changing the way that they think they're going to execute the work so this one's just a good barometer for making sure that what you put on your three-week plan is available well, very well said. And at number five, we have approval time. This is going to show the average amount of time it takes each package to be reviewed and approved. And tracking this KPI can let us know whether or not there are excessive approval times, which could be an indicator of an unhealthy QA or QC process. We will be calculating this as the average number of days that it takes your IWP to go from the ready for review steps to the approved IWP status. We want to try and have our all of our approvals uh, cleared and reviewed um, in a span of six to 10 calendar days. Okay, so this one's a personal pet peeve of mine. I can't count the number of times I walked from trailer to trailer on a job site trying to find where the physical copy of an IWP was. Oh yeah, I, I signed that last week or I think I gave it to, to Bob or Dave Trying to figure out whose desk it's on, trying to figure out who hadn't bothered to review it. So taking that away from paper, putting it as a digitized approach immediately resolves the issue. It means that I can tell who the culprit is. It might be that my safety person is regularly sitting them on them on them for days or my quality person or my superintendent or whoever it is. You want to keep the number of approvers to a minimum and you want to know who's sitting on it so that if you have consistent culprits, you can just have a chat with them and say, you need to start turning these around quick. And for number six, we have ratios of planners to craft. For this KPI, uh, what we're doing here is we're looking at the average number of craft personnel that each workplace planner has to support. And we want to track this KPI because we want to make sure that our workplace planners are not spread too thin, so not supporting too many craft personnel out in the field. The way we'll be calculating this, this is an average. So we'll be taking the total number of craft personnel on site, those that are going to be working on IWPs, and we'll be dividing that by your number of work based planners. And here the target is to have each work based planner supporting between 50 and 100 craft personnel in the field. Yeah, and, and this one, I mean, as you can see, the range there is pretty broad. And this one's a little bit fluid because it's going to depend on a number of factors. It's going to depend on the sophistication and experience of the contractor, 
the experience of the planners and the AWP maturity of the organization that's putting it together. Um, as you said, you're looking to just to check that you're not overloading your planners. If you've got one planner that's supporting three or 400 people, chances are they're turning out terrible IWPs just to sort of throw them out into the field. Um, what you're looking for on a small job, you might have planners that are multidiscipline. So you might have one planner that's doing all of your mechanical disciplines and another one that's doing all of your e &I. On a larger job, you're going to get much more into the true discipline-based planning um, so that a pipe fitting foreman or general foreman level is the one doing the planning for the pipe fitters, et cetera. Um, if you have an experienced contractor and especially one with a sophisticated tool set up, then they can support more. But if you've got one that's doing it with a piece of paper and a pencil or Word and Excel, then your number needs to be lower. And at number seven, we have the productivity factor. This is going to represent the achieved performance against the estimated target. That's going to be in terms of hours. We're tracking this to make sure that we don't spend more time on an IWP than we allocated for it. The way we are calculating this, so it is going to be earned over burn, and that is going to be earned hours over actual hours. And because we're calculating it that way, we want our target to be above one. So we want to make sure that our actual hours is less than the earned hours. And, and this one, part of the benefit of AWP is, is, as I mentioned earlier, this granularity of approach. Too many times we've seen too many projects where forecasting doesn't get even started until the project's 70% complete. Um, and that's straight from CII. So what this gives you is an early indication when you're looking at your early IWPs, if you're consistently seeing that your PF is 0 0.6, 0 0.7, very, very bad, and the contract is there telling you, oh, everything's going to be fine. We'll be fine. We'll finish on time. No problem. No problem. It gives you a very, very early indication as to whether or not that's true. You can start to look at recovery plans. You're not waiting until the situation has gone too far wrong before you're trying to fix it. And for our last construction KPI, we have time on tools. This is going to be an indication of your crew's efficiency by calculating how much time is actually being spent on tools. And the reason why we want to measure this, well, I kind of just mentioned it's going to be a measure of efficiency, and it shows us how much time is actually being spent working. And so O3 does have a product that's going to be our on tools suite that allows you to take tool time on tools readings on the job, and then you can report these out on the basis of discipline, area, contractor, and you can even do it at the project level as well. And our target here, we want to try and have a 40% at least, that or greater, time on tools or 0.4. And, and this is one I always use when I'm doing uh, AWP training for people. Even before you tell them the answer, you put up a quick message on the screen. It says, how many hours out of a 10 hour day does the average pipe fitter or iron worker or electrician spend actually working on the tools? And everybody says 70%, 80%. And then you flash up the result that between CII and COA, the two, the Canadian and American um, industry at leading sort of references there, they're showing it's between 33 and 37%. So just to let that boil in, the average person on the tool spends four hours out of 10 actually on the tools doing their job the rest of the time they're chasing materials they're chasing equipment they're they're on early quits and breaks that they're, they're basically inefficient standing around waiting for something or not executing the work and most of the time it's not their fault it's because we haven't done a good enough job of figuring out what the constraints are and what they're going to stop them so a target of 0.4 may look low but you would be better than most um, you know, we still get companies who say, yeah, we're at 70%, 80%. You actually watch what's happening. It's a very, very difficult thing to agree with. So this is really to give you an indication of where your performance is at and crucially, what areas you're still having delays, still having people standing around waiting. For anybody that's ever been on a construction site, 100 people on the site, 30 or 40 of them are working, the rest are milling around trying to find something. So this is just a good way of checking what that number is.
And so not only can O3 support all of these KPIs, but we can also have them all in one place using dashboards. And setting up dashboards in O3 is a repeatable process. So once you've agreed on your standard set of KPIs and you've set up your reporting, this is something that you can use for all future projects you have as well. It's not a process that you'll have to, you'll not have to reconfigure this each time. And then in addition to having a high level view of your data with these graphs, you can click into any of the elements that you see here and have a more granular idea of what the data is. And you can see the data that's actually driving the images that we see. So next, we will be discussing engineering and procurement KPIs. Here is an overview of what we'll be discussing in this portion. For our first engineering KPI, we are going to have EWPs released on time. And this is going to show the percentage of EWP releases that have met the agreed scheduled date. And we want to track this because if we notice that a significant number of our EWPs are being released late, well, that's going to cause our project to push to the right and it's going to cause more delays down the line. And we'll be calculating this as the as a running total of the number of EWPs released on time over the total number of EWPs that have been released. We do want to keep those to a minimum, so ideally we'd like to have more than 90% of our EWPs released on time. Yeah, and this is a great tool for a weekly progress meeting with the engineers, for example. Too often we spend our time staring at a 200 page p6 schedule trying to figure out where things are at this will just boil it down to a very 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 simple indicator to see whether they're living up to their promises i mean in this example that we have on the screen only 16 out of 29 ewps are released on time so that's going to be a problem for construction that's going to be an issue and again the sooner you can see this before it's becoming an ongoing consistent problem, the sooner you can talk with the engineering contractor about how to fix it, how to correct it, and how to stop it from happening going forward. So this is a great one just to flash up on the screen when you're sitting with them every week and say, why are these ones late? 13 out of 29, why are they late? Absolutely. At number 10, we have EWPs with holds. Here we are seeing how many EWPs have been released that have holds on them. And we want to track this because EWPs shouldn't have holds when they're released. And if you have a lot of EWPs that do have holds, then this can be an indicator of poor planning. For our calculation, this is going to be another running total. We're going to be looking at the number of EWPs released with holds over the total number of EWPs that have been released. And we do, again, want to keep this to a minimum. So you want to have less than 5% of your EWPs released with holds. So proper AWP would say that you should only release an EWP when it's ready. So if it has a hold, it's not ready. You will, from a practicality standpoint, you will get the occasional EWP that's 99% complete. And the thing that's not complete is really not going to impact construction. Um, frankly, if that's the case with my construction hat on, release it, give it to me, let me go to work on it. But if this keeps happening over and over again, if construction is always being given a package that's 90% complete and there's 10% hold littered throughout, and of the 90% that's there, you can only work on 30% of it because every, you know, there's a hold in every little place, it's going to have a problem. It's going to be an issue for construction. You're going to get into change management headaches. You're going to get into lots and lots of rework. So first thing, push for the EWPs to be hold free when they're released and treat any hold release as an exception, not a rule. And at number 11, we have EWP release delays. And this is going to show you the average delay for each EWP release. And it's going to help you understand the consistency of the delays and the issues that are behind those delays. And this is important because if our EWP releases are delayed, then all of our other work is going to delay, be delayed. So it's going to continue to push that work to the right. If we take a look at this graph here, this is a very good example of why we want to track this. In terms of our percentage of EWPs being released on time, we're doing a very good job. We're at 18 out of 
20, and that's right in line with the metric that we discussed earlier at 90%. But if we look at the two EWPs that have not been released on time, they are not just late, they are very late. They are months behind. And this is going to be critical to the health of your project and it's severely going to delay the work that is downstream from this. And the way we're gonna be calculating this is it's going to be an average of the duration between the actual release date and the planned release date. We don't want to see our releases, our EWP releases be delayed by more than about a working week. So five working days. Yeah. and. Part of the justification for this or part of the reason that we look at something like this is in modern projects, construction is always under pressure to mobilize as soon as possible. You know, you've got the first group of EWPs and it's like, right, okay, let's go. Let's get to site. Let's start pounding piles, welding pipe, whatever it is. Um, the problem comes when even if most of the EWPs are on time and the first batch of EWPs are released, if we get to the next one in sequence, the one to support our path of construction, and that's going to be months late, then one of two things happens. Either construction grinds to a halt, you end up demobilizing, sending people home, putting everything to, to sleep for a few months and then coming back, which is a giant pain in the neck, or you end up doing the more typical approach, which is you end up resequencing to suit the release from engineering, which completely goes against the whole point of having the path of construction in the first place. So the reason we look at average number of EWPs released on time and the EWP release delay, because it's not good enough just to know how many are released on time. The one late one, that one that you see right on the right hand side of that image, that could cripple the project. So you have to make sure you understand how many are getting released, what the average is, but also what the delay is on any singular EWP. Absolutely. For our next KPI, we have EWP revisions. And this is going to show you the average number of times that each EWP has been released up and revised due to post IFC changes. And the reason why we want to track this, so this is going to be similar to EWPs with holds, we don't really want to revise our EWPs. You want to make sure that once they're released, they're good to go and no further changes are needed. And this can be another indicator of poor planning. And we'll be calculating this as the average of the latest EWP revision number and only for released EWPs. We want that last number to be less than one year. Less than 0 0.1. We 0 .1. want fewer than one in 10 of our, of our EWPs to be revised. And luckily, Nick, um, I think it's fair to say all the projects I've ever worked, we've never, ever had a single EWP revision after it's been issued. Um, and for those of you who don't know me very well, that is sarcasm. Um, every time you have an EWP revision, if it's minor stuff that doesn't impact in progress scope of work, not a problem. Uh, if it's stuff that's not even yet been packaged and put into an IWP, not a problem. But too many times what you get is revisions to things that you've already started or already in progress. And every time construction has to stop or go back and undo something, you're doing significant damage to your schedule. Um, you're also going to have a significant impact on safety because it's been well documented that changes and unplanned scope are a very real issue for safety and it kills morale. There's nothing worse than when you are taking pride in the work that you've done, you've installed something and then somebody comes back and says, actually cut that out and do it differently. So you need to agree a target with the engineering contractor and hold them to it. Make sure they understand that you're going to be watching for things. So don't release my EWPs with holds. And once you released it, make sure it's good to go. Treat the EWP revisions as exceptions in the exact same way we talked about with the holds. And for our 13th KPI, we have RAS, RAS dates met. This is going to show the percentage of tagged items that are delivered on time per the agreed required at site or RAS date. And this is going to be calculated as the total number of tagged items received on time over the number of tagged items received. And the reason why we want to track this is because it's hard to begin execution on an IWP when you don't have all the materials that you need to do that work. 
And then we do want to have more than 90% of our materials on hand on time, our tagged items that is. And this one can be very, very crucial because uh, I've done jobs where the entire path of construction hinged on certain critical items of equipment. Um, you might have a large crane that you had to order a year ago to make sure that it was on site. You might have a specialty crew that's on site just to rig that one particular piece of equipment, of equipment and set it in place. So if you've got some of these tagged items that are critical to your path of construction, delays will push you to the right very, very, very quickly. So the cost and schedule impacts for these can be huge. So it's a very important one to keep an eye on. And for our last KPI for today, we have IWP material delays. And here we're looking at the percentage of IWPs that are impacted due to an active material constraint. And this is important because the last thing we want is to begin work on an IWP only to find out that we don't have everything we need to, to finish it. So this presents a really big risk to execution. So the calculation here is going to be the number of approved IWPs with active material constraints. Again, we don't want to begin work without having everything we need to do it. And the target here is to have absolutely no IWPs that have these constraints active. So we focus a lot on the role of engineering in field delays and rework. Construction loves to blame engineering for everything. Um, but I've seen just as many crews standing around waiting or held up because of materials. 10 people standing there waiting for a gasket, trying to figure out whether it's worth waiting, whether it's gonna be here in the next 10 minutes or whether they should down tools, pack up and move on to another job. You're trying to alleviate that. You're trying to alleviate the foreman spending time on the phone, chasing materials or one missing spool instead of being in the field, supervising the crew. It's incredibly damaging to productivity and for all the effort and focus we put on engineering, we need to put exactly the same amount of focus on materials because that will kill a project very, very quickly as well. And so just like we talked about with our construction reporting, uh, you know, everything applies. So again, we have all of our data in one place. We can support these KPIs. And the process is repeatable, so this allows to make it very easy for you, and it also allows for consistency. And then if we need to, we can get more granular by clicking into each of the graphs for each widget that we see here to allow us to investigate deeper and to get more, more of the narrative. And so just talking about the key takeaways for our discussion today and summarizing everything that we've gone over, so these proposed metrics will be used to assess the adoption of AWP policies on your project and also to establish adherence to those best practices. And the target will be where possible to use this data directly sourced from O3, which is going to minimize the need for additional data entry. And then rather than relying on periodic reporting, any of, the, any of the data that we source from O3 can be maintained live in the system. It's going to provide constantly up-to-date data uh, for your performance metrics. And these represent the O3 recommended metrics. So these can be adjusted based on your requirements and your policies, the needs of your project, et cetera. And so we're now going to turn it back over to Tori, who is going to moderate any questions that have come in during the presentation. Thank you, Nick. So we did have a few questions come in. Um, we'll start here. Our are these the only KPIs we need to track for AWP? No, so these are just a sample of the ones we recommend, but you know, as, you, as we said, uh, you do need to establish KPIs to match your goals, but these are KPIs that are going to be default uh, to O3. Another question here, how often should you be reviewing your KPIs? The value of doing this in real time, or the value of doing this uh, in O3 is that you're you're seeing this data in real time. And so, but in terms of a minimum, I'd say you want to review these on about a weekly basis. Okay. And then 
let's see. Uh, what problems have you had in the past tracking AWP KPIs? <laughs> um, several. Um, I think typically it, it hinges on the ability and willingness of the contractor to share information. I mean, I've, for example, I was working on a project a few years ago where the contractor was lump sum. Um, they did not feel it was necessary for them to share actual hours, which is obviously one of the ones that Nick was talking to that feeds the performance factor. Um, fortunately for us, we had it written directly into the contract. So quite honestly, they had no choice and ended up supplying that data and it provided, provided us with a lot of valuable information. So really, along with a lot of things with AWP in general, put it in the contract, make sure it's clear what you need, make sure everybody understands what needs to be provided and what data you need to track in order to populate these KPIs. If you, if you don't have the data, it's garbage in, garbage out. Okay, and then here's one that says, standard size of IWP packages. Is that measured by craft or across different crafts? Since the number of hours for an instrument crew on an IWP will be different, of the hours that piping crew can make in a given week. So again, it's that 500 to 1,000 is a standard range. Now, if you've got um, instrumentation crews where you've got two or three people on the crew, your package is going to be shorter, is going to be smaller. Um, so yes, it relates in a certain way to the crew size. What you're targeting is less to do with the number of hours specifically, but more to do with giving your people one to two weeks worth of work under a single foreman. So if a single foreman or four person is running a crew of six people for a week, that's going to be 50 hours times six people, 300, right? So it's not hard and fast. Make it reasonable for what you need. But the beauty of what we can do here is we can show those averages by discipline. So you can see, hopefully, that your average hours for your instrumentation crew might well be smaller. That might be two to 300, but your piping crews should be in that 500 to 1,000 range. So you can do it as long as you're setting the definitions and checking it yourself. Okay. Another question. Are or should there be any additional metrics for the scalable AWP model for smaller projects or bigger programs, as well as other domains than industrial, uh, e.g. commercial, residential, infrastructure, et cetera? Uh, again, it comes back to what Nick said as to measure the things that are important to you. Um, I mean, you can have KPIs for the number of RFIs that you generate. You can have KPIs for safety, some of the sort of uh, tangential aspects of AWP where we focus a lot on the efficiency of the crews, but we can also put in KPIs to see if AWP is helping our project from a safety standpoint, a quality standpoint, um, on smaller, more scalable jobs, part of what you're going to do there is not necessarily change the KPIs themselves, but change some of the target metrics, like we were talking about with the ratio of craft um, to planners. On a smaller job, you might have one or two planners. They might be covering several jobs. So you have to make sure that the data that you're deriving supports the way that you're executing the work. And it does get more complex when you're talking about a portfolio of projects because if you've got one planner supporting four or five jobs that planner is going to have to be their time is going to have to be divided up and you may even get to something as as detailed as looking at timesheets and seeing how many hours they're charging against each of the project so all i would say is pick the ones that support the reasons that you chose to do awp and the targets that you're deriving for your awp plan if your whole target is to improve crew efficiency in the field, you're going to look at time on tools. If your whole target is we want to use AWP to help our planning to reduce safety, your target's going to be safety. So look at the things that are important to you. Okay, and then we've got time for one more question. So let's go with this one. Um, where does the data come from? Reports from EPCs? And if so, how do we keep them honest? Uh, so I mean, you're going to get this data from a wide range of different sources. Um, so that could be construction, that could be engineering, procurement, et cetera. But um, you know, having a centralized location for all of this is 
you know, it's going to help standardize that data. It's, it's going to help ensure that it's consumed properly. And as to the how do we keep them honest aspect, I will quote, I believe it was a US president who said, trust but verify. Um, so that's going to be a critical thing is, is don't just blindly trust the data that's coming in, is check it. You know, check to see, look at, you know, if it's going right in and looking at the IWPs themselves, it's checking it against the P6 schedule. Check some of the data in the first couple of times you call them out on something that's wrong. Very quickly, they know that you're watching and very quickly those behaviors become a lot more improved. But a lot of the time, if the data that's supporting these KPIs is tangible enough, like number of hours spent uh, or number of hours earned, there's not actually too many ways to game the system anyway. Uh, so that whole keeping them honest aspect becomes less and less with this sort of data driven approach. All right. Great stuff. Good answers, guys. Um, so that looks like that's going to be all the time we have. And again, as a reminder, you can always reach out to us and give us more feedback and submit some more questions. We'd be happy to get to everything. Um, so just email us at info at o3.solutions, or you can reach out to us via the website at www.o3.solutions. And we appreciate everyone's time today. Um, thank you for joining us. And it, stay tuned to our website for our next webinar. It'll be towards the end of July. And thanks again for attending. Thanks, everyone.